Um, thank you for joining us to um, this webinar, Your Financial Future, The Six Things You Need to Know Before Leaving School. Uh, my name is Lindsay Diamond, pronouns she and her, and I work in the Alumni Relations Office here at Mohawk. Just before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping rules for you. Um, if everyone can please keep their microphones muted, um, that'll eliminate some background noise. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, we ask that you either use the chat feature, so you can just click the chat there and put your question in there, or if you can wait till the end um, of the presentation and we can, you can unmute yourself and uh, join in the question and answer period. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and shared to you after. Um, so you can kind of sit back and enjoy the webinar and then you can watch it again and jot down your notes and stuff that way. So just a little bit about tonight's webinar. So like I said, it's six things that you're gonna, the uh, six things you'd like to know before you leave college. Um, and the six topics are managing month, managing monthly spending and saving, using credit responsible, uh, understanding credit reports and your credit score, plan for student loan and debt repayment, identify common savings and investment plans, and navigate the basics of home ownership. So tonight we have Annette Moore, who will be our facilitator. Um, Annette Moore is, the, is a financial educator with the Credit Counseling Society. Annette started in the financial industry in 1979. Um, and has been with the credit counseling since 2005. Financial wellness is an important part of life, and Anita loves to share her knowledge and bring more awareness to consumers. So welcome, Anita, and I hand the virtual floor over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Lindsay. And welcome, everybody that has joined us this evening. Um, so I will dive right in. We've got a lot of information to talk about. And as Lindsay stated, uh, we're going to send you, send you a copy of the presentation so you don't need to take pictures of your screen. You don't need to write down anything at all. So yes, things, the six things you need to know before leaving school. It's hard to pick out just the, th the six things that you need to know because there's so much information out there about financial wellness and financial literacy. And the one important thing I'll start with is just to remember that there's always help out there if you need it. Don't don't try to uh, continue your studies. Don't try to work. Don't try to live if you're carrying a lot of debt or you're not able to manage your money. All right. You need to talk to somebody because there is help out there. All right. So let's go on to the next slide. So uh, thank you, Lindsay, for, for basically saying what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to pass by this slide. So uh, the objective after uh, Lindsay read the agenda. So my hope is that at the end of the session, you're going to know more about managing your monthly spending and savings. You're going to know how to use credit responsibly, know how to understand and read your credit report and your score, um, planning a little bit for student loans and debt repayment. Yes, we're going to go into savings and investments briefly and the basics of home ownership. So let's start with talking how to budget. Um, as it is, you know, with building a house, it's like that with our finances. We have to have a strong foundation in order to support the weight of the house over the long term. And similarly, the health of the finances starts with a strong base as well. And we have to understand, as I mentioned before, um, Understand how money management works, understand how your credit works. And, and if you need help, please reach out for help. So what is a budget? So a budget can be called a budget. We sometimes like to call it a written spending plan because what you're basically doing is you are planning the money that you need to spend now. Your everyday expenses, your housing, your food, transportation, but you also need to plan to spend to save money so you can spend it later. And that would be things like things that come up throughout the year, maybe car repairs, um, pet, bill, pet bills, uh, maybe tuitions, anything like that that comes up throughout the year. That's the stuff we have to save for. And remember that your budget or your spending plan, plan is going to include all of your income and all of your expenses. So your budget will also include your net pay. Regardless of your life circumstance, you must work from your net pay. All right. You're going to take all of your monthly living expenses, including 
irregular expenses, expenses. I mentioned some of those with the vet bills and car repairs. Um, and what about birthdays and Christmas or holidays and even getting your nails done or your hair done? If you don't get it done every month, you got to plan to save to spend that later. Emergency expenses and savings. Notice we've got savings as an expense. That's where we talk about paying yourself first. So organizing our money. So you can create separate bank accounts for or organizing your money. When I talked about the irregular, the emergency, your savings, you can have it, it'll look like this. You can have it go into one account, your fixed expenses, and then you're gonna separate it where some will go into your variable, some will go into your regular, and some will go into your emergency savings. Now, just going back here, one of the best ways to do that is to take the amount that you need to save annually and divide it by 12, let's say, per month, or you can do it every paycheck. That's fine as well. Have it automatically go from your fixed expense account, from your where your income goes, to your other expenses. So even if it's just $50 a month you're putting in your irregular expenses, that's automatically going to come out because it's out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, right? When you've got it set up and you know your income is going to pay your fixed expenses, fixed expenses are usually things that come up every month and they're usually the same amount and the same date. So those could be things like your rent, if you have a mortgage, um, utility bills, car payments, debt payments, Anything like that would be a fixed expense. Variable, you can see on here is gas, food, entertainment, your personal expenses, going to Starbucks, going to Tim Hortons. Um, I don't like to say that, but that's true. That's a lot of what we spend. Um, sometimes we like to go out and get a coffee and, and, and uh, Tim Hortons, sometimes some, some people more than others. But regardless of that, that's our basically what we call our eating and entertainment money. So those are variable expenses. If you start struggling and maybe you're ill for a couple of days and your paycheck's gonna be lower than you thought it was, remember what we're using to do our spending plan is what our income is going to be. And rather than have to do it every single month, what you wanna do is add up your fixed expenses to start with. Fixed expenses plus, house, plus um, transportation, plus your gas, or that's gas, plus your groceries, everything that is a need. You need to have this money paid. That gets paid first. If your income is short for over two weeks or a month, then you have to decide where am I going to cut back? So if your paycheck is short $100 and you have $250 a month for eating out, um, entertainment, recreation, you might need to cut that back because you can't touch your fixed expenses because you have to pay your rent, your mortgage, your heat, your debt expenses, if you have. And we don't want you touching your emergency expenses or your irregular ex expenses, pardon me, because as I said, if your income happens to be low, at a pay period and you've drained all of your emergency and your irregular, what are you gonna do? We want you to start with the expenses that you can reduce without it affecting you too much. Using credit wisely, this is a slide that I absolutely love because credit cards is something that everybody tends to use, but don't really understand how it works because most people will just say, go ahead, apply for a credit card, no big deal. Just make your payment every month and you're good to go. Well, these few slides here on credit are really gonna help you understand how credit works. And when we look at, say, a credit card that has a $3,000 balance, interest rates about 20%, the minimum payment that you're gonna have to make on that credit card is 2% of the outstanding balance. 2% of $3,000 is $60. So in order to keep your credit rating 
looking good, you're making your minimum payments on time, you must make that minimum payment every month. However, if you only make that minimum payment and you don't pay anything more, look at what could happen. 53 years, $12,000 in interest. Okay. And that's not a typo. That's not supposed to be $700 or $2,700. That is $12,000. Because when you're paying the $60, the majority of that is going to come off um, interest. And you're only going to have a little bit come off your balance. So every month, your balance is going to be charged at 19.99%. Very important, even if it's every, even if it's only $5, $10, whatever extra you have. Now, let's take that a little bit further and say, okay, I'm going to cut down my expenses by $10 a week. All right, that's $40 a month. So look at the difference on here. It makes when you're just because you're putting an extra $40 on there. Three and a half years, pardon me three and a half years, just under $1,200 in interest. Now, even with that, that's still, you're borrowing $3,000 and it's going to cost you $1,100. That's like a lot of money. So I would recommend that if you need to borrow some money, please, please make sure if you're taking it off your credit card, you have a plan to pay it back ahead of borrowing the money. All right. Maybe you've got some income tax refunds coming due. Maybe you've got um, a bonus at work coming due. Maybe you've got you're selling something, whatever it is. Just make sure you have a plan to get that debt paid off as soon as possibly. Credit is neither good nor bad. It's how we use it that makes it a tool or a trap. So don't spend money that you don't have. Always have a plan for repayment. Read your statements. On the very front of your statement, it will tell you if you are making minimum payments only, it will take you X amount of years to pay this debt off. Please pay attention to that. All right. Terms and conditions, the unnecessary fees, watch for those. Automate payments. If you know that you are going to just pay that minimum payment, or you're going to pay that $100, have it automatically come out of your account to pay it on a certain day of the month, that $100. So it's automatic going. So you're not going to miss a payment. Right. And remember, when I talked here about uh, the, the slide for before, actually about your budget and your spending plan, if you are short one month, one paycheck, do not rely on credit to help bail you out because look at here, okay? Do not rely on credit. That's the one thing we really want to emphasize and hopefully um, you can avoid. So understanding credit and how it's affected is definitely going to help when we're making financial decisions, All right? So let's dismiss any myths that you may, heard, you may have heard, you may um, talk about, people are telling you different facts, um, Let's talk about those. So what is on your credit report? Well, your credit report is going to have your personal information. It's going to have your name, your address, your social insurance number and date of birth, but those are gonna be X'd out for your protection. It's going to have your last known address and your previous addresses up to three years. It's going to have who you're working for. How long have you worked there and your previous employers? Right? A hard hit, a hard hit is called, is basically when you are applying for credit. You're going to go to a football game, you're going to go to a baseball game, and you walk in and they're like, hey, you want the hat? Oh, yeah, you want the bobblehead? Sure. Whatever it is you want. Normally, well, sometimes they're giving them away for free, but sometimes you have to apply for something and they may not always tell you what you're applying for. And they're certainly not going to say, oh, sure, you can take the application and go stand over there and read it. It should take you about 45 minutes to an hour. And you're like, no, nah, I don't think so. What am I signing? Oh, you're just signing here that you want this, blah, blah, blah. And you sign it. Guess what? They are going to do a credit check on you. And that credit check 
is considered a hard hit. And what that means is it's going to show on your credit report that you are applying for credit and it brings your score down a little bit. Okay, so anytime you are signing anything, if, it, if they say, oh yeah, we're just going to do a quick credit check on you, remember that's going to be a hit on your credit report. Even if you're, you're getting, you know, maybe college or, or you're going to continue your education, you know, some colleges have, you know, given away backpacks, giving away blankets, whatever it is, be careful what you're getting. Uh, soft hit. So a soft hit is when you're applying for, you're pulling a credit bureau on yourself so you can see what's going on. It's also if a landlord or an employer is checking your credit just to see how you're managing. That's a soft hit that you're not applying for anything. It just shows that they're doing an inquiry and it does not affect your credit score. All right, public record, are you being sued in the courts? Have you ever filed for bankruptcy? Consumer statement, if your name is the same as your grandfather, uh, grandmother, mother, dad, you have middle name, ju uh, you have a junior, you have a senior, um, please make sure that what's on your file is yours because they can be um, uh, mixed up. And if they are, it's going to cause a problem. If you have a name that is common within your family, you can call the credit reporting agencies and tell them you'd like to put a statement on there for them to double check the date of birth and the social insurance number. And trade lines and credit lines, trade lines and credit, credit ratings, we're going to talk about that now just a bit. So your credit rating is basically um, a letter and a number. So the letter is how are you going to um, sorry, let me turn that around. What types of debts do you have? And the number is going to show how are you repaying your debt? Are you repaying it on time every month? Or are you repaying it slowly? So here are the most popular credit ratings. You'll see the letters R for revolving, which would mean like a credit card. I for installment, which would be like a personal loan. And O for open, which would be, be like a cell phone. Okay, these are the three most popular ones. There are also other categories like mortgages, line of credit, lease. So these are the letters you're going to see. They are always going to be followed by a, a number is going to follow the letter. If you're making your payments on time every month, you will be reported, let's say um, it is a credit card, an R1. Oh, you kind of forgot to make a payment and now you're paying late, but you're within 30 days, it'll be a two. And then it goes down the ladder to threes and fours and fives. Then at the very bottom, you'll see a seven, eight and a nine. A seven is if you cannot repay your debts and you need the help of an outside organization like ours. Um, a five is anything that is four or more payments behind but it has not been sent to a collection agency, meaning you can still work them to do a payment plan. If it goes to a collection agency, it's a nine. Everything stays on your credit report for six years from your date of last activity. Remember that six years. If you have a parking ticket, if you have a library fine, that's a fair amount and you've just ignored it, and it goes to collections, guess what? It could show up on your credit report and hinder your future borrowings for up six years. Okay, It's not worth it. Please, 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 if you're getting envelopes in the mail, please make sure you open them. A lot of people don't. Um, oh, I know what that is. That's okay. I'm not going to open it please make sure you're opening it so you can be prepared for anything that's in there that says, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. I need to pay that now. All right. Your credit score is going to range anywhere from 400 to 800, 900, very rare we see a 300. Um, the lower your credit score, the higher risk you are. So if you have a 400 or a 500, and you apply for another credit card, they're going to go, oh, wait a minute here. This is not so good. This person's not paying their debts. 
or this person's overextended. If you've got an 800, it might show, oh, look at this person. They're paying their debts on time every month and they're not using a lot of the credit that they have available. So 35% of your credit score is made up of how you make your payments. That's pretty significant. Your amount owed. Do you have credit limits of $5,000 in total and you owe $4,899? 30% of your score is, 30% is going to affect your score or 30% of your score is based on that. I always get trouble saying that. So what that means is please don't keep at your limits. Please make sure, like I said before, you have a plan to pay off that debt. If you find yourself where you are not able to um, get yourself out of debt, again, please talk to somebody, please call our office. We can help you with a budget and how to get your debt paid off. All right, you look at the little small pieces of the pie, the green one, how long you've had your credit history, how long you've been on the file, the different types of credit you had, you have, and the little turquoise one, new credit 10%. Remember I talked about every time you apply for credit, 10% of your score is made up of new credit that you're applying for. Okay, you can get copies of your credit reporting, of your credit reports at Equifax or TransUnion. There are other companies in Canada. There, um, the two I know of, there may be another one coming on board, I'm not sure. Um, actually, there's one that I know of, Borrow Well. Credit Karma is in the United States. I would recommend that you stick with Equifax and TransUnion and you can get them online. If you go through a third party, um, you're not guaranteeing that your information is up to date. Okay, it could be behind, who knows? So we just suggest you go straight to the source, which is Equifax and TransUnion. Make higher than minimum payments, order your credit report for free. You are responsible to correct any errors on your credit report. And remember, if you do fall into difficulty, it's okay, it does happen. Look what we've been going through with, with COVID and, and with the economy. A lot of people are struggling and you know what? It's okay. But again, and I'm going to say this over and over again, please reach out to somebody if you're struggling. Because all it's going to do is cause stress and stress causes illness. All right. Student loans and debt solutions. So student loans, about 25% of students have difficulty paying back their student loan. Now you can declare bankruptcy on student loans, but your last loan that you take out must be seven years ago. So it's not from the first loan, it's from the last loan you took out seven years after that. And high school, high student loan debt, it may limit your job opportunities. Because if you have high student debt payments or payments on your, on your student loans and they're high, are you gonna say, you know what? I can't even work one job. I'm gonna have to go work two jobs because I've got this, because I've got this other debt, right? Government loans. Now, there's no payments required in the first six months after you've left school. You are responsible for selecting your payment schedule. Once you finish your studies, you will get notification in the mail that it is now time to choose how long you're going to take to pay off your student loan. You usually have about 15 years to pay it off. Take the smallest amount that you can, but pay extra when you can. Repayment assistance. Repayment assistance is there if you need it. No borrower will have a repayment exceeding 15 years. So when you're applying every, you can apply every six months for repayment. And that might just be, you know what, you finish school. Six months later, you just don't have that job that you studied and you don't have that big income coming in. You phone them and you tell them, just don't have that income in, coming in to make that payment. So usually they'll, re, they'll um, 
renew it for another six months, right? And the repayment assistance, if you're phoning them and telling them you can't make your payment this month, it will not show that you're behind on your credit report, all right? Repayment calculators, you will get a copy of the presentation just in case any of you have joined us late. You can go to, to the slides and take a look at this and here's your repayment calculators. Repayment strategies. So consider your circumstances and be realistic. Okay, that's why I said at the beginning, take it over 15 years. You might say to yourself, you know what? I don't wanna have a, a student loan for 15 years. And you don't have to have it for 15 years. However, if you take it over 15 years and the payment, let's just say it's $150 a month. And you go, you know what? I can do that. I'm going to double that so that I'm actually really only taking it for seven and a half years. Or if you're struggling one month, you just have to pay the minimum of 150. And here's some repayment strategies when we include credit cards. So there's two different ways to pay down your debts when you have debts. One is called a snowball and one is called an avalanche. And what we usually recommend is that when you have credit card debt it or any debts at all, it's best to start with the one that has the lowest balance first and then make, pay, make minimum payments on the other debt that you have. You're gonna pay that lowest balance off first, then you're gonna move to the next one and so forth. So if you see here, um, credit card number one has a $5,000 loan, $5,000 balance, but it's at 19%. Credit card number two still has 5,000, but look at the interest rate. And then your student loan here, okay, they have a payment of 450 a month. So we have, what, $1,600 here that we can pay a month on our debts. Start with the highest debt that you've got there and let's bang that off, a thousand bucks a month. All right, five months, it's gone. Remember, you're making the minimum payment on your other credit card and on your student loan at the same time. Still those months, very, very important. So after six months, you've paid off $5,000. Wow, isn't that gonna feel good? So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, okay, now we've got $1,600 between our credit card and our student loan. So we're gonna pay off our credit card first so we can get rid of that debt. $1,150 a month for four months, gone, just like that. Then on month nine, look at how much you can put on your student loan, okay? $1,600 a month. So try and remember, if you've got a few debts that you're paying, come up with a strategy. Savings and investments. Now, a lot of people get quite excited when I'm going to talk about savings and investments. And, and especially when I do schools and it's like the grade 11 and grade 12s. And I often have, have the guys yelling out, are we going to talk about cryptocurrency? I want to make some money and get be a billionaire. You know, they just, they're just really anxious to dive in there because they have no clue, no idea at all. So just so you know, we're not talking about cryptocurrency today. I'm sure you don't want to get into that. So we're going to talk about some different common savings plans. And one of them is an RRSP, which is also known as a registered retirement savings plan. And also we're going to talk about a tax-free savings account, which is a TFSA. All right. So first of all, let's talk about what is an RRSP. An RRSP is a registered product. And what that means is because it's a registered product through Revenue Canada, it means that you get to defer your taxes on the amount that you're putting in there. So you're gonna pay less taxes on your income. If you have income, let's say, of $60,000 and you're in a tax bracket that's 40%. I'm just throwing numbers out there. And when you work full time and your employer says, okay, I've hired you at a salary of $60,000. So I know right off the bat that you're at a 40% tax bracket. So they're going to withdraw enough tax to send to the government. 
to make sure usually that you don't have to pay at the end of the year. So when you get your T4 and you go, okay, I made 60,000. Now, if I put $5,000 into my RRSP, or even better, you were putting it there every month, that $5,000 gets deducted from your 60,000 income. So now you're not paying taxes on 60,000. Guess what? You're paying taxes on 55. I hope, I hope you're following me. So the amount that you put into a registered product gets deducted from your income. So you're paying less tax. But your work, your employer has already taken 40% off that $5,000. So you're going to get a refund from Revenue Canada. Okay, that's how an RRSP works. It's registered, it's tax deferred. Tax deferred means you're getting a break on that $5,000 because you're not gonna pay tax on it now. However, retirement, when you take it out, the idea is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket because maybe your income is going to be maybe 40,000 and you're gonna be in a 25% tax bracket. So anything you take out is going to be taxed at that lower amount. That's the whole idea of a registered retirement savings plan. Okay, a tax-free savings. Now, a tax-free savings is not a registered product. You do not get to write that off on your taxes as a deduction off of your income. However, what it does is it protects any interest, anything that you earn in that tax-free savings. So I'm going to back up just a little bit. If you have, I just have to watch my time as well. If you have um, a tax-free savings account, you can invest that just like your RSP. You can invest it into mutual funds, anything like that that you like. Anything that you earn just like in your RSP, any interest you earn, dividends, is all going to be within that tax-free savings. And you can take that out and you're not going to be taxed on it. If you put money into a savings account right now, a term deposit, let's say it's paying, well, I don't like to use today's figures because, you know, we're, we were talking about the new norm of things. And, and, and unfortunately, the norm right now is inflation is higher than what dividends and interest is being paid on your savings account. Normally, it should be the other way around. So if inflation, I think it's gone down to 5%, maybe. So if inflation's at 5%, and you're earning 3% on your investments, we're still 2% 2% behind. However, if you can get a government, a GIC, which is a government investment certificate at your financial institution, some call it a, um, a term deposit, where you're going to say, I've got $5,000 and I want to put it in there for one year, what's the best rate you've got? and they say 3%. Okay, at the end of the year, the interest that you've earned on that $5,000, their bank is gonna send you a slip and you're gonna have to put that on your income tax because you're gonna have to pay tax on it, okay? See here, um, if you're just reading, a tax-free savings account is an investment vehicle that does not apply taxes on any contributions, interest earned, dividends, or capital gains, and can be withdrawn tax-free. RRSP, remember, we have to take, pay tax when we take it out. A term deposit in the bank, we do not. However, it pays interest. And if you have a fair amount of money in there and you are making a lot of interest, you're gonna to have to pay tax on that. So put it into a tax-free savings so you don't have to pay tax on the investment that you've earned. So what is an investment? I've been sitting here talking about investments. So basically investments are somewhere that you want to give somebody your money, invest your money somewhere in hopes of you're gonna make more money. 
And a lot of people right now are, are the stock market. I'm sure you've heard of the stock market. It's, you know, interest rates are fluctuating, stocks are down, stocks are up, it's all over the place. And if inflation was 8%, do you think anybody is getting 8% return on their money? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So again, if it's 3%, if it's 0%, we're already behind the eight ball because we're having to put out money for groceries that's costing us 8% more. Pretty much that's what it is. So when we're looking at an investment, we do want to try to make sure that yes, we're investing that money somewhere that's going to make us hopefully some money in the future. But we want to protect the money that we're putting in there. You want to protect your investment. So you're, if you're putting it into a term deposit at the bank, uh, you'll see at the very bottom, bank products. That's going to protect your investment. You put $5,000 into that GIC, that term deposit. When it matures in one year, you're getting your $5,000 back. But when you say, oh, okay, but I'm only going to get 3% on that money, that's not very much. You're right, because you see at the very bottom, see this big arrow, the gray arrow, your potential risk and reward. The more risk you're willing to take, perhaps, perhaps you may get a bigger return, may get a bigger return. Right now, people who are investing or invested last year, maybe at 2%, 3%, and stocks are down 4 or 5%. These people are laughing. Yeah, I, I did the right thing. That's great. Whereas somebody who said, no, I'm not getting 2% on my money. I'm never going to do anything with that. Let's put it in mutual funds and let's get me some, some, you know, let's go into stocks. Let's go into some real estate. See how that arrow was going up? The risk you're investing your money ours is higher. So the first thing your investment advisor is going to say to you is, you have $5,000 to invest. Are you going to be comfortable if you need that money, whether it's in one year or four years, and you're not going to get $4,000 back? Maybe you're only going to get $4,500. Is that okay with you? Most people are going to say no. However, when you're going into investments like stocks, mutual funds, funds, options, futures, I'm not even going to get into that with you because I'm not a sales, uh, invest, inv sales professional on investments. That's somebody that you'll talk to an investment advisor on. The higher the risk you go, the more your return's going to be. So they might show you a chart and say, oh, but if we put this $5,000 over here in five years, the average has been 10% return. And you're like, oh yeah, perfect. 10%, that's what I want. Market's going up. Your money's doing good. All of a sudden, oh, oh, look, they're calling it a pandemic. Everything is shut down. What happened to the markets? Boom. You're like, oh no. And now I need my money and it's only worth $4,200. What are you going to do? The idea with investing in mutual funds, I'm just going to use the term mutual funds, is to leave it there for long term, okay? Leave it there for 10, 15, 20 years. That way you can ride, ride, um, ride the wave of the ups and downs. And there is big waves. You will see that. So if you're not worried about that $5,000 and you say, no, I don't need it. Let's just leave it there. I'm good for five, 10 years. I'm going to be investing more money. I'll put that more money I'm going to invest. I'm going to put it maybe in safer stuff, which is perfect because that's what a mutual fund is. A mutual fund is a basket. Take an Easter egg basket that you've got a whole bunch of eggs in. Okay, your Easter egg basket. Um, not sure what the next slide is here. Uh, homeownership. Okay, so I got to keep talking a little bit. I sometimes get sidetracked because, because um, I could go on forever about this. So when you have an Easter egg basket, let's pretend, and you have eggs in there. So, oh, we've got some mutual funds in there. We've got some term deposit in there. Uh, maybe we've even got some bank products in there or, or some gold. Maybe you've got some minerals in there. Some, uh, not minerals, some um, 
gems or whatever you want to call them. There's, the, yeah, mineral, they're in gold, silver. I can't really think of the word I'm thinking about. So you're, what you're doing is you're diversifying. You're saying, okay, I got a little bit of everything in here. That's what a mutual fund is. It's picking out different products that you want. Now, a mutual fund is often pre-made up and your investment advisor will say, okay, this one's got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it's really, really secure. So it's down at the very bottom here with the gold and the bank products. So we're not, you're not, your potential, your risk of losing money is really, really low. And you're like, that's perfect. I like that. But you might say, well, I think maybe I want to go a little bit riskier. So maybe they'll put, maybe they'll put some um, Apple shares inside there, Apple stocks or something. And you go, okay, that's going to give me a little bit better return, a potential for better return, but your risk is going to go a little bit higher. So a mutual fund is a basket. It diversifies your money rather than investing it all in one place and only getting 3%. It's, you're going to invest it in a whole bunch of places. And the, the mutual fund companies have mutual fund managers, and this is what they do for a living. They make those baskets up of the best ones that they can find and say, okay, this is what we have. All right. Home ownership, mortgages. Now we also have a slide. I don't see it in here, but that's okay. Right now they are mentioning, I know, especially in the Vancouver area, um, rents, I think I actually saw in Ontario, pardon me, Toronto, maybe now your rent is like $3,000 or something. That's what's happening here. If you're looking for a one bedroom downtown Vancouver, you're going to pay about $2,500 minimum. And you're lucky, you're lucky if it's going to be 600 square feet. Okay, some of them are 400 square feet. The idea there is you probably work downtown so you can walk, you don't need a vehicle. Okay, so you're saving money doing this so you can afford to pay that rent. But a lot of people who can't afford to live downtown Vancouver and who work anywhere else, I'm on the outskirts of downtown Vancouver, the rent is still $1,800, $1,700 for a one bedroom, $2,200 for a two bedroom. So you need to really, really figure out, can you afford a home and why do you need to buy a home now? All right. The numbers are going to tell you whether you can afford it now. Um, your down payment, anybody putting less than 20% down is required to get what's called default insurance. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. You can borrow, you know, your RRSPs. So the government says, oh, hey, fantastic. They've put money into their RRSPs and five years has gone by, 10 years, whatever it is, you got $35,000 in there. You can take that out and use that for down payment to a home. $35,000 might not get you much nowadays, but so maybe they'll increase that. I don't know, but it's a start. Give you the $35,000. You don't have to pay tax on that. Remember I said you have to pay tax on your withdrawals. You don't have to pay tax on that. You use it for your down payment on your home, and then you make payments back to your RRSP starting the second year, and you make them over 15 years. Okay, so your payments are not that high. Um, high ratio mortgage. This is the um, default insurance I was talking about. If you don't have a lot of money to put down, then you have to qualify, you have to pay insurance. But the bank is also going to see whether you, you pass a stress test. And we always said, I always said, knowing that I worked in the finance industry for a long time, Mortgages were 2%. Oh my gosh, I hope we never see them go up to 5% because those people that got them at 2%, they're not going to be able to afford a double payment. Guess what's happening? But the stress test said, hey, we're going to put it on a five year. So if it doubles, we're going to know that you can afford it. Conventional mortgage, that is where you've got more money to put down and you don't have to get the insurance, the default insurance. All right, you still must pass that stress test. And passing that stress test means maybe at 2%, you got qualified for a $400,000 mortgage. But now with the stress test, you have to qualify at a five-year rate with just 
it means you're going to get approved for less. Credit unions don't have to use the stress test, but banks do. Homeownership costs. Remember, if you're looking at a homeownership, take a budget worksheet. We've got them on our website. I will send you the link to our website and the budget worksheet in an email that goes out. I want you to check everything that's on there because it, a lot of people think, oh, mortgage payment, that's it. No, it's a lot of other things, not just your mortgage payment. All right. So in conclusion, my hope now is that you're able to budget or you know the beginnings of how to work a budget so that you can manage your monthly spending and your saving. You know how to use credit responsibly. You understand a little bit more than you did about your credit report and your score. You know how to plan for repayment of your student loan and or debts. You can list some common savings and investments and maybe some pros and cons, and you understand the basics of home ownership. All right, so now you did see